It's August 2021, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and this month we're talking about filters. Now, when we say the word filters, that can mean so many different things depending on your generation um, and what you, you do and, and what you do for a living. But we're going to take filters and we're going to apply that to the people, projects, and programs of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're going to break it up into three separate segments. Segment one is going to be about the people. Segment two, we're going to touch on one of our projects. And three, we're going to apply that filter to a program. And this month, it's going to be uh, the Women's Equality Day observation, which is occurring on August 26th. So going into our first segment, segment one, people. July of this year, we welcomed a new commander into the district, Colonel Brian Hallberg. And we sat and we talked with him. And what we notice about his leadership strategy is it's not just leading by being a leader. It's leading by helping the mission be the best it can be by taking away, filtering, if you will, the, the items that either distract our employees or just make it a, a more more difficult workplace or anything that impedes us delivering the mission. So it's a different way of looking at leadership, not just leading by force, but leading by creating an environment where your people can be the best, best as uh, as Colonel Hallberg says, the best you that you can be. All right, so let's get into segment one, people. I'm excited to talk to you um, because, you know, not only are you a commander, but you're the new guy. So right. what are your impressions? So what have you noticed for your first couple of weeks that you've been in the position right. as commander of the Norfolk District? Yeah, um, I, I would say like the, the most impressive thing is just the mission that Team Norfolk does. It's so impressive. The wide variety of the things that we do for the Commonwealth of Virginia for the, the people, really, it comes down to the people. It's it's the soldier, the airman, the marine, you know, the navy, their family members, and the community. All the projects that we do, and then the people that are on those projects are just wicked smart. They're you know great professionals. The great communicators with their project stakeholders, and I'm just proud to to come here and be part of the team. So I feel like you know I'm the, I'm the new guy. And I just feel feel happy to be part of, you know, that team now. What was your last assignment? What kind of stuff were you doing? Where were you? What was your role? And then how do you think that prepared you or didn't prepare you or helped you in any way to what you're doing now? You know, Brian Hallberg's you say experience, the experience in the Corps of Engineers is very minimal. Like, you know, I had a couple months transitioning facilities that the Corps of Engineers was building for, you know, the Afghans over to that the Afghan army and the police and, um, you know, specifically at the National Defense University. So my my experience in the Corps of Engineers is, is you know, almost nil to none. I, I've spent my career in the operational army, you know, doing combat engineering for, you know, over 22 years of, you know, my officer career. Um, so I come in just with my, my mind wide open on how the core works. I want to understand, you know, the businesses and the processes so that I can just help, help everyone in Team Norfolk um, succeed in their mission. You know, saying all that, that, you know, I've been, been in combat engineering. I got to spend the last year as the assistant commandant at the engineer school. And, you know, there is really about taking initiative to improve the engineer regiment. And when we talk about the engineer regiment different from the Corps, it's, it's really about the, the active duty or the National Guard or Reserve Forces um, across doctrine, organization, training, um, improving materiel or leader development or personnel proponency. And so that's what I did on a daily basis was seize initiative to do those improvements. But in that environment, it is a Department of the Army civilian heavy, and it's that way for on purpose because you have to have continuity, um, you know, year after year because it takes years to make changes in the regular Army. 
you know, 10 years to get to where we are today that we have um, Bradley's instead of 113s. And so changing out military folks every year or every two years, like you just don't gain traction. The second part of your question. So what did, what did I learn working in TRADOC at the engineer school that I can bring forward is, you know, I, I've been, you know, demilitarized a bit. Like I'm not coming into this organization to run it like an army unit. You know, I understand business processes, understand how do, how do we recruit, how do we retain, how do we counsel um, Department of the Army civilians. So I have that as a takeaway. And then one of the, the greatest initiatives I think I had in the last year as the assistant commandant was working on diversity. How do we improve diversity and be more inclusive, acquiring the talent to be Army officers? And I think it's very similar that we are trying to acquire diversity into our very technical workforce. And so a lot of the lessons I learned there, I think are you know important takeaways um, that I can help influence indirectly as my role as the, the district commander. Yeah, one thing you know that we we learn and we hear from the army saying, you know, you want to build those high performing teams. You're you're gonna have to have that respect across the board, that diversity across the board, and provide people in that environment personal growth for everybody, regardless of of any of our differences or similarities. That being said, the one thing I, I wanted to touch on or have you talk about, because it's interesting with the Corps of Engineers, is we're an army component, but predominantly made up of civilians. By no means are we requiring, you know, our employees to put on the green suit and, you know, so whenever I talk about recruiting and recruiting talent in the core of engineers, it's just very technical. The engineers and the scientists that we have, it, what I learned being the assistant commandant is there are less and less students in college that are pursuing those very technical engineering degrees because they're hard. The engineering professionals across our nation, a lot of them are retiring. And so there's going to be a lot of vacancies. And so we got to have outreach. And I think the outreach really needs to start in high school, talking about STEM degrees and inspiring you know, young people to want to go to college, earn these technical degrees, acquire them to come work for us in the Corps of Engineers. And, and I think an interesting part of that, too, is, you know, as difficult as that is to obtain, if you're working for the for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, you're working to not only build things, but energize the economy, you know, reduce disaster throughout the world um, and, and secure the safety of our nation. So it's, it's you know, there's that bigger picture and also develop think- these critical partnerships. But I think that's the why. So, so why why come work for the Corps of Engineers? We are playing the infinite game. It's not about one project. There's a series of projects over time that improve the quality of life. But then, you know, we are we are protecting lives and protecting property, right? For for everyone here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and those problems are going to continue, you know, on into infinity. Um, because whatever we construct, it still needs to be maintained, right? And uh, and that's what we see across our nation. A lot of the infrastructure is, is just old. It needs to be maintained or rebuilt. And so we're always playing this infinite game of improving the quality of life for people. That's why. That's that's why I go that's study. That's why. <laughs> you got, I think you got excited there, sir. You got, <laughs> you got into that. Well, you know, it's that too. And, you know, I'm looking through the news clips. Look how many news clips we're seeing now about sea level rise. So you know it's an interesting it's an interesting balance that we play too. So that's one of one of the things that I think is just it's it's fascinating. So um, you're here, and how long have you been? A couple months in the oh, seat. Shoot, I'm only three weeks going on the fourth week you now on <laughs> oh, Thursday. Man. Yeah. From what you've seen, you know what you even knew coming in. What do you see as the most imperative functions for? a district commander for the Army Corps? I think the most important thing is I lead in directly um, through the division chiefs and the supervisors to get the mission done. I am up and out. And I'm not not supposed to get down and deep and into the weeds. It's about trust. And, you know, trust, it's about character and competence. And, you know, what I see of the workforce is we have a very competent workforce. And they have the character to get the mission done. So I am leading indirectly through all of our, you know, project delivery teams to get the mission done. But 
um, saying that I'm the strategic communicator. So I think that's the other imperative function, um, you know, for these PDTs up and out to, you know, relationships and partnerships, which, you know, in my initial assessment are very strong. We have very good relationship with our partners. You know, I, I think that it, the other part of that is the fight for resources. So as a strategic communicator, I got to know what resources we need to allow the workforce to accomplish their mission. And so I'm the the one that gets things unstuck for our employees. You know, I, I lead off of like, you know, people are the most important. So it's about command climate, providing a positive command climate for all of our employees that they can come to work and just be the best you every day. You don't have to worry about harassment. You don't have to worry about discrimination. Like any of that, any of that, any of that's happening. Like I want, I want, you know, supervisor to nip that in the butt. And if you don't trust your supervisor, then you go to their supervisor. And if at some point, you know, a supervisor can't handle it, then, you know, I, I'm here. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take care of it because it's just uh, not necessary um, in our workplace. I just want people to come be their best every day. That's awesome. That's awesome. So anyway, we do, and we have great employees, but we also have, and you mentioned it, great partners and stakeholders. And it's been a rough couple years with COVID and just other life things. Um, have you been able to um, talk with any of our partners or stakeholders and see some of maybe the challenges that they're facing right now or what they're looking at into the future? So I think, you know, the challenges and, and I'll get to the COVID piece um, because there's an indirect uh, relationship to the challenges that we have. Uh, and so, you know, the challenge with the Corps of Engineers, you got to have an authorization and appropriation to get a new start on, on projects. That's that's always the, the struggle. The stakeholders want to get um, some initiative done to you know, save lives, protect property, improve the environment. All great, worthy reasons why we exist. Um, but you got to convince Congress that that is, you know, appropriate to do. Um, and so we have a lot of projects and there's opportunities right now, especially in, you know, the current administration with, uh, uh, you know, the, the new infrastructure bill that, you know, they're working on yeah. and, and, and they're, uh, you know, working on these authorization and appropriations. We're going to see the Corps of Engineers are going to see a lot of money. I don't know how much will come to Norfolk, right, for our projects, but across the core, there's going to be a lot of new authorizations and appropriations um, to get done. But the problem that COVID, the indirect problem is, is the cost. The costs are rising because the supply chain um, is strained. There's um, some material costs. And so that creates challenges. And, and what I see, you know, the third effect to the employees here in Norfolk is they are working a lot harder to create options for the customer, right? Because the costs are uh, above our programmed authorized amount. And so they're having to do some rework um, to, to try to get the cost lower and, you know, negotiations with the contractor because, uh, you know, their, you know, bid is only valid for a short amount of time because they're worried about the cost. And so it's creating the situation where project stakeholder, the one, you know, the, the, the one that's going to use it at the end of the day, they're, they're having to ask for more money above the, the threshold for for reprogramming. And okay. unfortunately, it just, it's, it's creating some rework um, that isn't efficient, but that's what we have to do to, to accomplish our mission, delivering the project, you know, on time and getting the cost right, you know? Yeah. Now, is that like, and, and is, as far as you, us being you say employees is that how we're helping out putting in like trying to rework things think outside the box like how are we helping out those partners and stakeholders who are you know also yeah. having a, a tougher time what are we doing yeah. so creating options so between you know our engineering division and, and contracting it, it, it all it's all about creating those options um which that's where the rework is and, you know, going back to, um, you know, the, the contractors submitting the, the bids for, for those builds to, to, uh, to try to get the costs down. So it's, um, you know, that's one part of it and coming up with different strategies that allows flexibility 
um, you know, to, you know, the, the project stakeholder. I, I think what Big Army, this is what I heard out of the executive governance meeting from USACE yesterday is that, you know, the Senate is considering increasing the above threshold uh, reprogramming level to 12 million, mm-hmm. which would, I think, be helpful in this COVID environment. Uh, but we got to wait and see, you know, how that, um, you know, will assist us <laughs> because then it's less work on the options. Yeah. Um, We're in the waiting place right now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And then that allows the stakeholder to go back and ask, you know, ask for more money. So it's that and it's communication. So you got to flatten communication. I, I feel that's what our workforce is doing. They're flattening the communication with the, the stakeholders on, you know, really to manage expectations uh, with the cost. Here are your options. Yeah. You know, it's not easy. It has not been yeah. easy in my observation in the last three weeks of what our workforce is <laughs> doing. But I'm so appreciative that, that they are doing that. Yeah, they're working their butts off. They're, they're definitely doing that. So um, I know in your in in only your three weeks here, some of these questions are <laughs> coming at you pretty hard, sir. So I appreciate right, you right. answering me. Keep shooting. <laughs> all right, so this workforce that's working so hard. Um, you know, do you have any goals for our workforce? Or I mean, is there anything that I know? So the so the word around the district is you want really want to get around, and talk to different people, and be able to you know. So every, <laughs> we're all that's the buzz. Um, I don't know if you've got a chance to actually do that and talk with folks. To be honest, I need to do more, right? So I um, I have been on the road quite a bit and uh, and, and met with. You know, people at, at our, our field offices and our presence, but I need to do more in the building. Um, and it's just about time management. I need to get out of my office and go down to the the third and the fourth or the uh, the third and the second floor and the first floor and do some more. Right. So I'm not there yet. Um, and it's going to take me a while to learn everybody's names, especially now that we put our mask back on. Um, you know, harder for me to memorize faces to names. So I just ask patience. Uh, I am trying really hard. I am not the type of person, you know, that I can remember right off the bat. I wish I, I wish I, if that's the one thing I could approve about myself, I, I wish I could do that. Um, so if I make a mistake, just correct me, um, you know, and I get, I'll get better on the names. But you know, as far as as goals, um, look, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm about, you know, I want everyone to be the best you, and to be the best you, that requires, you know, doing some development, individual development. And so, you know, my goal is just to encourage our employees to continue their self-development. You know, one of, uh, you know, in my assessment, in, in one of the briefs I got is we're only like at a third of uh, our foundation course. And that's just like basic uh, understanding the doctrine of Department of Army Civilians. So I, you know, I asked the employees, let's do, let's do better there. Let's get that done. You know, supervisors, uh, you know, getting out and doing their supervisory, uh, you know, course. Uh, but I think within the district, what we continue to do better, and I work with Matt Ferguson on, is continue to invest time in developing our supervisors and giving them the soft skills that they need to work, especially in this environment, this hybrid environment. It is a lot harder to communicate with employees. You just don't have the same situational awareness because you're not all in the same room and you can hear other conversations and you know, hear, hear what's going on in their life. Like you have to make a concerted effort every, you know, to, to call up the employee and say, Hey, Brian, how are you doing today? How's your family doing? Your kids all right. And so, you know, giving more strategies and techniques on, you know, how, how we can be more efficient in doing that. And then what, what I'm beginning to understand is like our supervisors, you know, they, they got dual roles, you know, none of them are just straight supervisors, the supervisors, and they're, they're all, they also, you know, do the hard work. You know, we the, you have to talk about having those relationships and striking up those conversations, knowing who's having a baby soon and who, you know, all those different things. And, and not having that has really, I think, hit us, hit us pretty hard when we were so, so tight. Um, but yeah, both pushing through and figuring out and, and moving forward. So, um, Speaking of moving forward, this is our, we've been, we had a little break with our podcast, right? A couple month break from between season one and season two. Um, we're trying to come back bigger and better. So I wanted to ask you, since I have you here, what do you want to hear us cover on Core Talk? What, what, what segment would you like? Wow. Um, you know, we got, we got some awesome project <laughs> delivery teams working tough tough problems right and um and i'm and i'm gonna pick i'm gonna pick on one this one thread 
Um, but I, I think that we should do our best to communicate up and out to our constituents, and not just in Norfolk, but you know across the nation on why, why in coastal storm um, risk management do we include structures? Because um, you know there's this b- belief we can you know do a lot of non-structural stuff, and I'm not I'm not saying that non-structural um, doesn't improve you know coast, coastal storm risk management. Um, I think it's additive, but but why why have structures? Um, I think is worthy of our engineering folks to to try and explain, and why it's important to um, as we have you know sea rise, more intense hurricanes. Um, you know why it's important to have those. I think a segment on that would be great. I think um, you know our regulators do a lot of tough work, um, a lot of stuff in the media across the nation. You know, so, you know, maybe covering the technical aspects and the core of engineers, whenever we look at wetland permits, you know, how do we look at it? Uh, you know, wh- and what are the impacts to environmental justice? Um, because mm-hmm. we have to look at it, at it technically. I, I think that'd be, you know, worthy of, you know, trying to explain. Or maybe even, you know, with our regula- regulatory team on um, co- consultation, you know, how do we do it? How can we do better? And, and I, I think that those you know, three things are, are worthy to try to explain, you know, why they're important and how we do it and what, you know, those benefits are. I like it. I got three good ideas from you, sir. Regulatory folks, they're good talkers, uh, but sometimes it's a little tough to get these engineers on board. <laughs> too. I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to put that one in. <laughs> when you're out well, walking around, you talk to them. <laughs> a little bit of positive pressure, you know, gentle yeah. nudge. <laughs> Well, sir, I um I want to thank you so much. This was a really this was I'm so glad we got a chance to kick back off season two, having you leading the charge. I think it's gonna be really cool next three years. And uh, I went to officially welcome you to the Norfolk District to Core Talk. Well, th- thank you, Andy. And I just I just want to close with like it's all about people, right? It it's about caring for the individual. It's caring for their family. Um, and I know it's, it's tough. We, you know, every day we're looking at the COVID environment and, and uh, you know, the impacts of that. It's about the command climate here and making sure that everyone can be their best you. And then relationships, our relationships with our stakeholders, they're strong. I just want to maintain you know, that strength over the next three years and uh, continue doing what we do, which is serve the people, you know, those soldiers, airmen, Navy, Marines, their family members and the constituents here in the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. the first time we're using this medium like the actual podcast audio meeting to introduce the entire project to the community i'd like to have the city weigh in and the core weigh in and 
talk to us from the, the, the beginning of this. Like, how many years ago did this start? Why is it important to really give us the big picture of what the entire project is and why? So, Samantha, Kristen, whichever one of you feels comfortable starting in. Sure. Um, oh, Samantha, do you want to? <laughs> Okay, um, so we've been, we, the, the core in the city, have been working on this project since 2005. Um, we had been in the planning stages, and there was a feasibility study that the Corps of Engineers can, um, completes. And the feasibility study determines whether the project is feasible and how to go about doing it. Um, we don't get into a whole lot of design. After the feasibility study, which that's at least three years, then we go into the design, and, and that took a year. The city, of course, has always been uh, supportive and as a partner, but we, have, of course, require 35% funding in that. And then there's an agreement required. But this project has been supported by, by Congress and WERDA um, since 2014. And why is it like, what What was, what's the problem? Like, what a big picture, you know, there's many problems in the world and many environmental issues, but specifically, what is this, um, this project hoping to fix or mitigate? Well, uh, it, it's an ecosystem restoration for, for the Lynn Haven, but it's not just um, the Lynn Haven, it's part of the, it's part of a, a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. So the Lynn Haven River itself, you know, because it's in Virginia Beach, the city of Virginia Beach and the Corps of Engineers are partnering, but it's a, it's a larger effort that's actually supporting the restoration of the entire Chesapeake Bay. You know, just in, in Virginia Beach, there's the Lynn Haven watershed, which is 64 square miles um, and 150 miles of shoreline with fish habitat, wildlife to include the reefs, uh, tidal marshes, mudflats, and some open water habitats. So uh, all, over time, um, recreation and just development has degraded the quality of the water as well as all of these habitats and fish and wildlife. What we're doing now is restoring it back to the, as, as much as we can to the original state with creating additional habitats, with um, improving the water quality with grasses that were native and that were originally in the Lynn Haven. The idea and the goal, and, and so far it's going well, is to restore the Lynn Haven to its natural state. Um, now, and how does that like, let's talk about the city. So for you, Samantha, why should Virginia Beach residents like know about this and how does it impact them? Why should they care? One of the reasons that people come to Virginia Beach is to live and vacation in the beautiful beaches, the natural areas. And since the Lynn Haven is the largest tidal estuary in Virginia Beach, it's generally the heart of Virginia Beach and offers some of the most important recreational areas for fishing, boating, crabbing, paddle boarding, bird watching. You'll see residents and visitors out in the Lynn Haven just enjoying it. And to have a project that makes an impact to improving that resource for our residents is really important. So yeah, it's not just, I guess what you're saying, like not just a way of life for Virginia Beach folks. It's, this is also has a, a, a major economic benefit as well to us. So it's, uh, it's multifaceted across uh, across the core or across I'm sorry across the the, the, com the community exactly. so what um so what is what is the we talked to Kristen and we got the Norfolk district um, side of things tell me about the city so how does the city approach this or what's your role in the in the project as a whole yeah so the city is the local non-federal sponsor for the project um, so I support the project as the like liaison or representative for the city. And apart from the um, sponsor funding, the city also helps with the public coordination, acquiring the real estate, reviewing plans and permits, and just general project discussions. Very cool. Now, talk. we're going to go into the project. We're going to go a little bit deeper now because we've got the nice general idea. Um, and... My girl Kim, uh -oh. my homegirl. <laughs> We've been through a lot together through this project, man. Like if I was having any more children, I would name one of them after you. But I'm not mm -hmm. having any more kids. But she's like, no, don't do that for me. But uh, so let's talk about like this is when I first got on to the, working this project. I remember sitting and listening to Kristen talk about this in the library, and I'm like, there is no way I'm gonna understand this. I'm just gonna fake it till I make it. And <laughs> it is a complex project, right? Like it's, it's. 
so there's parts and phases. So you have the big project, right? Like the big, the whole project. Um, but let's break it down a little bit for like people like me to understand it. What are the, what are the parts and the phases of those parts? Okay. Well, um, that's a great question and it is probably the one thing that confuses people the most on this project. Um, Y'all have done a great communications effort uh, online uh, explaining that as well. But um, yeah, so the project was originally authorized uh, to do three elements and those three elements are wetlands, submerged aquatic veg vegetation and reef habitat. Um, so they actually had a goal for each one of those things, acreages uh, for each one. So it was 38 acres of wetlands, 94 acres of submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV as we call it, and then 31 acres of reef habitat. So we've been working toward um, dividing this into phases and we're trying to do one element per phase. Uh, so we actually have three activities. This is where it gets confusing. Three activities per phase um, is, is kind of the goal. So thus far in phase one, we have the five and a half acres of wetlands at Princess Anne High School. Uh, we've got eight acres of reef habitat um, out in the Lynn Haven, uh, right kind of in the, in the middle of the Lynn Haven. It's a beautiful uh, project. And then we have about six acres of submerged aquatic vegetation um, and that's actually a collaboration with VIMS and they're doing some research as well as uh, doing the submerged aquatic vegetation planting out there. Very cool, very cool. Now, and and I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna come back because there's a lot more I want to ask, especially about the about the reef habitat um, on it because it was just a super cool thing to see happen. Um, but you know, what we're getting at, we're talking with the district and the state. Let's is about partnerships, right? Like we know that at the core, like we're always like partnerships, but this is really how we make this happen. And one right. of the coolest partnerships that I found was actually with Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Um, not only do I have a personal interest because my kids are they they go they're in that public school system, but I wanted to talk to Melissa a little bit and tell us a, first about. Let's go over like the role of of Virginia Beach City Public Schools in this project. Okay, hi, um, yeah, the wetland restoration is right in the backyard of Princess Anne High School, it's roughly five and a half acres of their total site. And as Samantha was saying, the, the water is really the heart of Virginia Beach, both for residents and visitors. I think all aspects of this phase one project, students, particularly at Princess Anne High School, can really benefit from them. Um, not only can they benefit from them in their everyday life and having a, a more healthy environment to live in, they're really going to be part of the implementation of the project, which we're really excited about. Planting actual plants that will be there that will help to restore our bay to what it should be. The partnership that the city and the core is creating with Virginia Beach City Public Schools is a share of the expertise for the, the Thalia Creek, which the project is along, the Lynn Haven River, with a, which a lot of students enjoy in their daily life, and then the larger Chesapeake Bay, which is really a national treasure. Students won't just gain an understanding of the actual site in their own backyard, but they'll really also gain an understanding of how to work with any data that's collected, guidance and expertise that the city and core um, are partnering with Virginia Beach on is is really fantastic and it's a great opportunity for all of us. So and and make sure I have it right so the the students are going to be from Princess Anne right the Princess yep. Anne High School they're going to pretty much go in their backyard where Thalia yep. Creek is yep. and they're going to be assisting with the the the, uh, the wetlands portion because we have our three parts our three elements so it's gonna be the wetlands element um, I think it's, is it the first phase or second phase of the wetlands element? Is this, this phase, is phase one? one. Yeah, okay. we're, the, we're the only wetlands restoration part of phase one where they get to be a part of the initiation of yes. all different phases of the project, which is exciting for them. That's now, are they, are they going to be planting and then is it monitoring the growth? Is that the big picture? Absolutely. What? Yes, absolutely. And we have a variety of interests from almost a dozen sciences within Princess Anne High School itself, um, everywhere from environmental sciences, earth sciences, biology, and oceanography. Um, so they will have an opportunity to be part of the implementation, the planting. And then as the monitoring commences for years to come, um, they will also be able to share what they see as they go out and visit the site. They can um, collect data wise from the water quality They'll be able to share um, different types of species that they see out there, both species that might live in the grasses and, and 
birds, aquatic life, um, and really be able to share that not only with their own peers at the high school level and with the uh, professionals at um, Army Corps of Engineers, um, but using GIS data, they'll also be able to share that information across the school division to other grade levels as well. And we hope that this is a really great opportunity for growth in this type of um, collaboration with our professionals, but also growth in just us understanding um, students' capacity for their curiosity and exploration of the natural environment. It's just really a great opportunity. It's it's so cool, and I'm I'm partial to of course Virginia Beach anything, but you know you think about like what, what did you do in high school? Did you do anything like as I didn't? Like I think this is just such a a really cool thing that the public schools is doing in incorporating. Let's talk about it. You're doing so you have the science aspect, but you also have like you're having you know they're understanding engagements and partnerships. They're ambassadors to the environment. I mean, Samantha, you're getting your next generation of like eco warriors, you know, yes. <laughs> thanks to uh, thanks to the the public schools. And then we have Kim. We know you were a biology teacher in your former life. Life science. So like, yes. so, yeah, there you go. So she's just this is like right up her alley. So it's it, what's interesting is is um not only, it's not just a project for you guys at public schools. This is an investment into the future, these students' futures, but also into our area. I mean, there's kind of a, you know, this is, is it's an interesting way of, 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 of teaching, of schooling. And I, and I hope this is something that we continue to see. And, you know, I, I like I said, Virginia Beach City Public Schools, I'm a big fan. So I know you all probably have a lot of things like this going on, but uh, hats off to you for it. So who, um, who in the public schools, like who helps make this happen? Who are some, you got a name drop or something for it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, our superintendent is a big supporter of environmental education. Um, Dr. Aaron Spence, he's wonderful and a big supporter. Our executive director of facility services, Tony Arnold, and our chief operations officer, Jack Freeman, are also, you know, there's a lot behind the scenes, as all the project mm -hmm. managers here know, for the years that took for um, us to get to this point where at construction. Um, and we really had a lot of people in our um, administration um, backing the project. We have a great um, environmental sciences um, coursework offered at Brock Center right now, which yes. we're hoping to collaborate with them as well. Um, you know, we feel at Virginia Beach City Public Schools, um, you know, environmental education, it's really aimed at producing citizenry that's knowledgeable and concerned about the environment. Um, they can do some great problem solving um, and also see the benefits of um, working through problems and working through the monitoring of uh, as this as this wetlands becomes restored, seeing where they can provide um, those type of solutions in other areas, you know, whether they go into sciences or art or, you know, whatever they go into, just being able to, to identify problems, see and, and be part of a solution is really great. So. Yeah, actually, that that figuring out how to figuring it out, and, and that's that's you know what it's all about. And I know now, uh, Kristen was there when I started learning about the project. You were the, the the number one person, but then we lost you for a couple months. You were deployed for a couple months, about eighteen months. Eighteen months. <laughs> now we're, we're, give or take. That's that's like sixteen hair appointments for me. So. Um, <laughs> How, where were you deployed to? And real quick, what did you do there? Um, I was deployed to Kandahar, Afghanistan in support of um, Operation Resolute Support uh, to train the Afghans. And I was at first the director of public works um, for improvements all across the base. Um, and then I became the mayor of the base. Um, <laughs> kind of interesting, uh, definitely in a male dominated world where Many of them were not engineers and didn't necessarily understand the science of why we were doing what we were doing. Oh, we got to touch back on that. It is Women's Equality Day on August 26th. So I'm just saying that's, that's right for the picking. But in your absence, we did have Kim who kind of got thrust into the hoop and just took off running with it. And I think when the coolest, what we got to see when you were working this ginormous and complex project was the reef balls. The reef balls are initially a point of contention, but I think, you know, and, and you saw that through all the way. So talk to us about the reef aspect, because this is fascinating stuff. Um, well, we, 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 <laughs> okay. So for every, for every phase we're trying to do, um, our, 
a reef habitat that is appropriate for that location. Uh, so I, I don't want everyone to think it will always be reef balls, um, but that particular location, um, because of just the, the currents and the velocities out there, we didn't have a lot of choice. Um, we've had other reefs blow out that were only shells. So we just we decided to go with the reef ball uh, and, and it was definitely a sustainable uh, answer to the question. So once we started building the reef balls, we actually got the specs, so they were actually very small, um, but they do provide uh, three-dimensional habitat, both for fish species as well as uh, oyster. It's not just benefiting the oyster out there. We're hoping to create quite a recreational uh, area for, uh, for residents. And, and when you did that, the, you know, you worked with, you guys picked the most amazing contractor who actually designed this epic system to place these reef balls. I'm gonna have to put the link in the show notes to show some of that video, because we were yes. like, <sighs> like when you're an oyster geek, yeah. you're like, that's the kind of stuff that you, that you dig. Um, yeah. <laughs> It, if you want me to speak to that, we let them innovate and and kind of let the the contractor decide how they were going to install all these reef balls at the site. And he came up with his own design. He's probably getting a patent at this moment, um, but it laid down 54 reef balls at one time with the correct spacing. It could even change to the contour of the bottom so he could just lay it and it could be out. They had them loading in six minutes and unloading in like 10 minutes and um, actually finished the project what I believe uh, 18 months early. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. And to watch it happen out there, they did have a crew in the water and a crew on the deck that was loading and then a crew that would be in the water receiving, but um, it was amazing. And we actually, the problem with the project was we were very nervous if we were gonna be able to lay that many that quickly um, to make sure that we would stay in the in within the performance period. But yeah, they blew us away, they blew us away. You know, you let the innovation do what the innovation does and the innovators innovate. And, and, and also it's worth noting they were an awesome crew of people and yes. i think i stuffed what was a crystal like four donuts when we went out to visit them on the barge i like put myself in a sugar cone because they kept offering me donuts you don't turn down free donuts so no now, <laughs> she was like four donuts um so samantha you know i mean and th there was there was also, you know the public had a lot of questions about it and and you did a lot of work and busted your butt to try to inform people and make them comfortable because you know, all of us, you know, especially just Lynn Haven Beach folks, like, are, you know, our waters are important to us. We want to know what's going on. So tell me a little bit about, you know, just generally, how does the city of Virginia Beach keep folks informed and, uh, um, you know, some of the ways that you go about doing that, make sure they know, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. It is. It's important to the success of all of our projects to have that information out there and to have the public, um, involved and see what's happening and get as excited about it as we are. Uh, we got to work closely with the core on answering some very specific questions that some of the residents had once we started getting the project moving. Uh, before that, we had some public meetings. So we had some great displays to explain each part of the phase one site and where they were going and what the details were, what it's going to look like. Um, when we have it out there in the water or implemented for the wetland site and and to be able to communicate that opportunity with the residents and to get everyone involved is really important. Yeah, that is a, a, a thing that I wanted to bring up. The city has really done, um, you guys bend over backwards to talk to your people and to get out there. And, and I, it's not like, a, hey, this is a governmental body. You guys are are knocking on doors, answering emails, answering phones. Incredibly, incredible, like the, the, it's, you're doing a fantastic job. So I, as a communicator myself, I appreciate that. And I just wanna make sure that our audience notes that. And I see, speaking of notes, Heather has joined us. <laughs> it's what, the, why I'm excited to talk to you, Heather, is you have a different person, well, and a little bit like Melissa in, 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 a, in a way, but, but different too, in that, um, you were part of an organization that was a partner with this program before you came on now as a member of the Norfolk District. So Chesapeake Bay Foundation, correct? Yes, that is okay. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> so you you were working for them, um, and now we have you now at the Norfolk District. But um, I really want to find out when you were part when you were um, involved with Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, what did you know about this this 
uh, this project and what was CBF's involvement in the project? Well, one of the the greatest things that I find about the whole oyster world is just the the partnerships that have been we have established. And so early on, you know, being a uh, I was the oyster restoration specialist for Chesapeake Bay Foundation for six years. And so I got to attend the uh, interagency meetings that the core, you know, put together along with all the planning meetings with other um, interagency and working groups. And I loved how this like bivalve could bring so many people together from all walks of life. And just because everyone has this, the same passion for, for them and what they can do. And so one of the last things that um, I did while I was at CBF was I knew, of course, of this bigger um, Lynn Haven project. And I knew that CBF also had a um, a few grant deliverables in the Lynn Haven River as well. And I know um, real estate and finding acreage and uh, areas to build these reefs can be a little tricky um, as we've all seen. And so one of their, their pieces of their grant was to place uh, about 200 reef balls or, or reef structures somewhere in the Lynn Haven. And I knew that um, the core at that time was, was looking for something um, similar to put around their um, submerged aquatic vegetation site. And so I kind of was just trying to put two and two together and thought, okay, let's, maybe we can make this work. We can check the box for not only putting this um, additional habitat out there for the cores um, deliverables, but also for this grant deliverable. And it, this, amazingly, the stars aligned and it was able to, to happen. So CBF was able to place uh, approximately 200 reef structures out at that SAB site. Man, the oyster gods are just smiling down on us. I <laughs> did like sacrifice something to them. I don't even know what that would be. But um, so yes, we have you now on the uh, the Norfolk District team. We're so happy to have you. We've got you and Kim, who you guys are like going to be a dynamic duo. I'm sure you know going forward with this. Um, but what what I'm interested in is, and I wanted I want to kind of um go around, and I I want to ask um. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking to our folks, we're telling them about the project. Um, what can the, the public, the average person do to help us in this effort? And it could be anything. Maybe sometimes it's just like listening to what we say, sharing the podcast, something like that. So I'm going to put Kristen on the spot first. <laughs> um, but like, what would you say if someone said, hey, this is awesome. I want to help. What can I do? I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So um, many people look at it just from their personal perspective, especially if you have property on the water and you know, you're, if you're lucky enough to have that and you look at it from a perspective of, okay, how is this going to impact me and my personal bubble? And, and what I would ask is for those that are listening to this and those who understand what we're trying to do is to share that information and to talk about it with, with their fellow residents, their friends, um, to understand that this is really going to impact our entire region positively, uh, therefore impact everyone individually positively. And this is not going to be a negative impact on anyone, but a long-term restoration project that will improve our water quality recreation and our way of life. So I would just ask that everyone share that um, and communicate that as they understand it. Perfect. And I'm gonna, so Melissa, um, what can folks like me do to not only support the public schools in just this project, but as a resident of Virginia Beach, um, what can I do? So I think, I think the important thing to maybe share with this is that um, restoration efforts are for all ages, right? Um, you know, interesting tidbit, we had um, a peer put in across Thalia Creek, um, with, with the help of our executive director and our sustainability officer, Tim Cole, and um, Thalia Elementary School students were out there. And they were concerned with the construction because we were getting rid of the invasive species, the Phragmites. Um, and it was it was great because they were, there was a real honest concern from the students part, young kids, younger than teenagers, elementary school. And so, um, you know, the teacher listened and, and we went and we spoke to them about it. And then they kind of 
They they were embraced the project even more. They embraced the waterway behind them even more, understanding that we're getting rid of invasive species over there on Failure Creek, and um, and trying to um, restore the habitat with native species. Um, so I think just the value of all ages and um, what they appreciate from their environment. Um, just just knowing that it's it's not just for adults necessarily, and kids have a lot to offer to the conversation too. So, so as parents, we can talk to our kids about this. This can be one of those conversations, you know, getting involved and in, in understanding their environment, making it a priority, and getting involved. Um, yeah. Also, joining your parent teacher organization. Just just putting it out there. That always a <laughs> 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 little there. All right, Kim. So, yes. what would you recommend? Um, folks do to learn more about the project or contribute? Well, I think there's two things. I think they could, and, and Heather's going to be excited when I say this, um, they can recycle their oyster shell because uh, we could be using shell in future uh, restoration efforts out there. Um, and they could also join um, some of these great organizations that are that are looking for volunteer help all the time. Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Lynn Haven River Now, um, they're all have the same uh, goals and objectives that we have um, for for a cleaner uh, Lynn Haven. So uh, that and then ha as it corresponds to the Chesapeake Bay, because uh, all those things add up, you know, small, yeah. small, small actions add up to, you know, big, big, big results. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to put the um, all those links in the show notes below so our <laughs> listeners can go and kind of peruse. All right, Samantha. What do you recommend that um, Virginia Beach residents can do to support this, but like any other environmental project? What can we do? I think it's great when residents aren't afraid to reach out, get involved in um, the project, learning about the improvements, um, getting excited about these improvements and learning how they benefit the waterways. We're hoping to add more educational signage and materials to a lot of our water oh quality improvement sites to be able to spread that information and, and get it out there because not just this project, a lot of what the city does in uh, water quality improvement and uh, stormwater improvements that have a huge impact on the citizens and the general quality of life. So check out the city's website, see what projects we have going on. Yeah, you definitely, you guys make the information available, but it is up to us folks to like go and find it. You know, it, it, it there has to be some effort on the, the citizens part to say, I, I need to learn about this, this is impacting me. Really finding the connection between um, what, what hits home, what hits people's heartstrings, whether it's a, a bay critter like, an oyster, probably not, but if you connect the oyster, unless you're like me and it is the oyster, but, um, you know, if it's an, a dolphin or a, a sea turtle or an osprey, finding those connections and knowing that, especially for, you know, this project in particular, it's all interconnected. You know, we need our wetlands. We need the submerged aquatic vegetation. We need our oyster reefs to all have a healthy bay, to all be able to fish and recreate um, for the industry. So, you know, I think whatever that that piece is that drives home for somebody, I think knowing then what that web looks like as you either um, expand out or, or dive in. And then another thing that I think is so cool, because I was just like looking at the six of us and just mm -hmm. for, you know, young women out there saying like, you know, the, the six of us, we're in, you know, really high leadership roles and just knowing that, you know, as young women to just aspire to, you know, if you really want to be an environmentalist or a project manager or an engineer or, you know, whatever you want to be, you know, just um, know that you can. And so I think just, um, again, looking at big pictures and, and doing what's important to you is really kind of um, what's going to help improve our environment and our our world. <laughs> Beautiful. I just want to drop the mic at this point. I got that I'm out. Heather's taking taking over from this point. But yeah. So what I got when when you were talking, what I wrote down was starting point: water-based spirit animal. Like find your locate your spirit animal with water, and then go from there and figure out how you could help that, and then help along the along the environmental chain. Anything that we didn't touch on right now, but you feel it's important that we um we do we do either address or talk about or that you bring up. 
I guess um, what I would what I would say, you know, following on to our communication and our ask of the residents of Virginia Beach, um, but also the the you know the other cities that are involved. This is not just affecting the city of Virginia Beach, but we're asking for support because we're going forward into something that is somewhat unknown and unknown can be scary to people. So we're moving on to phases two and three. As we do that, we're just looking for help and support from the community. And when I say community, our overall community, not just the city of Virginia Beach. Um, so I guess what we would ask is, is for support and for people to take that further step into clicking on the links at the city of Virginia Beach to understand the projects that are going on um, and then to just support us as we continue in the future. Hey, Andy, um, the only other thing I would add is I, I don't I don't think most residents uh, understand how difficult it is to get one of the ecosystem restoration projects. And uh, it was a very unique, I, I mean, we'll think, look around, uh, how many rivers are getting their own uh, congressionally funded line item for ecosystem restoration. Yeah, so it was the only one uh, in 2018 to get a new start. Uh, we were very lucky uh, to have it. So um, as Kristen said, we're going to phase two and three. Uh, and it, it, I don't think it'll be anything uh, that different than what we're doing in phase one. Um, so residents can have already kind of experienced uh, phase one in, in certain areas, uh, if you're near Princess Anne or if you're near Dix Creek. But yeah, the support for the next uh, two phases. And we definitely uh, we want to we want to end phase two and three on a high note. You know, we want to we want to get in there and get as yeah. many people working. Hopefully we'll get some more collaboration um, out there in those phases. We're, we're looking for residents uh, that, that might have great ideas as well. So. Absolutely. And I feel like we're going to be doing a follow up on this. <laughs> like, you know, this is something definitely because it, it's so epic and so big and there's so many parts to it and there's so much yeah. information that we should probably touch base in a couple months and 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 update folks on where, where we've been and where we're at and where we're going. Yeah, no, Andy, I definitely agree. Um, I just wanted to, again to say, you know, what a powerful thing the collaboration and the partnership is along with students' passion and curiosity. I think those two things going hand in hand um, with the expertise of the core and the city, helping to guide the curriculum that's gonna be built um, along with the monitoring process over years to come is just, it's really exciting. Um, it's exciting for the students, but it's also exciting for our community as general. So um, we're really looking forward to a successful project there. Yeah, and you're excited too. I can see it in your face. I'm, I'm very excited. It's been it's been a long project. There's been a lot of hoops to go through to get to where we yeah. are. And and again, everyone um, on this podcast and beyond are to thank for that. But um, I think the benefit just just outweighs any of that. And 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 for years to come, hopefully, um, it'll be a generational thing that just keeps growing. So. Yeah. Well, I got to say, ladies, I know it's not been easy for any of you. And like, you know, I, I hear, hear a little bit of the trials and tribulations and the hard work and the long hours, the long thankless hours. Um, I'm, I'm going to just keep pushing forward, guys. You're, you're, you're doing it. So I'm really proud to be friends with you guys, to know you, to be a part of a project with you. I'm not going to get too sassy because I have a tendency to. But you guys are doing it. And, and I know it's, it's, it's you know, usually pretty thankless, but, uh, you know. Thank you so much.
United States government in a joint resolution of Congress designated August 26th of each year as Women's Equality Day. The Women's Equality Day commemorates the 1920 adoption of the 19th Amendment of the United States Constitution. This amendment prohibits the states and the federal government from denying the right to vote to citizens of the United States on the basis of sex. To talk to us today about women's equality, diversity, and inclusion, we're joined by Ms. Karen Baker, who is the Regional Programs Director for the North Atlantic Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Ms. Baker began her service with the U.S. Army in 1997, and in 2016, she was appointed to the Senior Executive Service, which was established in 1978 to, and I'm quoting here, ensure that the executive management of the government of the United States is responsive to the needs, policies, and goals of the nation, and otherwise is of the highest quality. To sum it up, Ms. Baker serves at one of the highest levels in the United States government. She's a civilian, but essentially the equivalent of a general or an admiral in civilian service. Thank you for joining us here today, Ms. Baker. Can you tell our audience a little about what you do as the Regional Program Director for the North Atlantic Division? Well, the North Atlantic Division is made up of six districts, and we serve uh, a large, probably one of the largest areas, uh, regions of uh, the globe. So we have districts uh, serving uh, uh, civil works projects and, and, and located from, from Maine through Virginia supporting 50 military installations in that region. And we also have a European district that supports two continents, Europe and Africa. So we broad, diverse portfolio, uh, probably one of the largest within the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, definitely in terms of military programs and the most diverse uh, portfolio that that I, I think arguably we can say uh, in, in the Corps of Engineers. My job is really to ensure that our districts are poised and, and have the resources and, and everything that they need to deliver quality projects on time and on budget and safely. And uh, what I do in that regard is we do a lot of uh, working with them in terms of ensuring they've got the resources, that they've got the guidance and policies that they need to deliver. And uh, I do a tremendous amount of stakeholder engagement uh, with them uh, and with their 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 primary customers to ensure that uh, they that that uh, everybody understands uh, where we are with each of our projects and we get our programs delivered. So that's that's a broad area of responsibility from Maine to Virginia and and Europe. Um, it sounds like in Africa. Uh, and, and Africa. <laughs> did so, I miss that? Did I miss that? Yeah. In the <laughs> okay. Um, so it sounds to me like. Um, not only a diverse portfolio, but you, it sounds like you also have a very diverse customer base and, and I'm, I'm guessing uh, probably a very diverse workforce too. Ms. Baker, I'd like to do a little time travel with you this morning. Uh, is that okay with you? Absolutely. So I'd, I'd like to take you back to Seneca Falls, New York in night in, <laughs> I would like to take you back to Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. And, and you probably are aware that Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 is the site of this country's first women's rights convention. And it's packed with the superstars of, of women's rights of that age. So women like Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And Frederick Douglass is there too. He's, he's, lending, he's lending support for the women's rights movement um, because he sees that as, as tied to his, his own effort to, to free the slaves in this country. And so during the course of this convention, these women um, are there and, and some men, there's about 30, 30 some men there too in support. They're there to, to talk about uh, the condition of women in the country. And, and they, they sign, on the last day, they sign the Declaration of Sentiments. And the Declaration of Sent Sentiments is written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and it's kind of a mirror of the Declaration of Independence. And she wants that document um, to kind of carry the same, the same weight as the Declaration of Independence. So it opens with a preamble that declares that men and women have the unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And from there, that document, just like the, the 
the Declaration of Independence, that document goes out to 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 lay out some grievances of that era, right? So it says, hey, you know, women women can't vote. They they aren't represented in the government. If they own property, it's forfeited to their husband when they marry. If they divorce, they lose everything. And colleges and employment are closed to them. So in short, in, in 1848, uh, women are basically treated like property. And, and life sounds pretty bleak. But if we come back to the, the present age for a minute, we're, we're 101 years uh, removed from the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, today, we have a woman vice president. There are 147 women in Congress. There are three women serving as Supreme Court justices. And we have a woman, Christine Warmoth, who is serving as the Secretary of the Army. So, Ms. Baker, there are some who would say, um, to put it in military terms, that we're mission complete, that we've achieved the dreams of, of women like Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and, and we've made it. We're done. Have we, have we, have we, have we reached that in state? Um, what would you say to, to people who say we've reached our in state on equality? Well, I think first of all, even as we go back in time, it's really important to also acknowledge that even with that ratification of the 19th amendment, it was still some years later that uh, we we saw where all women were able to vote, were able to have those rights, and it was uh, while while there was a lot of great progress, and in that Seneca Falls, as you mentioned, uh, Fre Frederick Douglass there, reminding us that uh, we were also about re we also needed to be recognizing the the rights of people of color. Uh, it was still a long way before women of color uh, had the same full rights, even after the 19th Amendment. And so I think that's most important too, and look at you know where we've come and how we have. Uh, incrementally uh, uh, continue to be inclusive as a society and, and the great gains that we've made um, all throughout history. And there, we're in a great place right now, as you've mentioned, in terms of women in leadership and, and rights for women. However, there's still a lot that we have to do. Uh, we're proud of where we've, where we've come and, and where we are right now. But I think that uh, even the last year, in the dialogue that we've had across the North Atlantic Division, we're finding that there are areas where we need to still close the gap. Um, one of the things that uh, we have been talking about is the McKinsey Report, which came out this last year that talked about how women have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, how it has impacted, uh, how they have uh, had advance in the workplace and some of the sp special challenges that women, and especially women of color, uh, have had to addre address. And even President Biden, in his proclamation on Women's History Month a few mo months ago, mentioned that we've had an astonishing number of, of women leaving the workforce, 865,000 uh, in September 2020 alone. And so I think we have to acknowledge that and, and say there's a lot more that we have to do. I think we're in a great place uh, within the core and within the army. Uh, I think that uh, as we've had these conversations, what we've heard from our workforce is that we have put flexibilities in place that are helping them to uh, not only it, it continue to do their jobs virtually, but to thrive in advance. Um, and we've also learned a lot about what we need to continue to work on in order to, to uh, make sure that we're inclusive to all. Ms. Baker, you mentioned the, the McKinsey report and the discussions that you're having there at the North Atlantic Division and um, that, you know, the pandemic has caused women to leave the workforce in greater numbers. And you've mentioned some of the efforts the Army is making to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in the workforce. And so uh, last year, the U.S. Army published a diversity, equity, and inclusion annex to its Army People Strategy. And in it, it quotes the Army Chief of Staff, General James McConville, who, who stated, we win by doing the right things the right way. Uh, we win with our people, and that is why people matter. So the document goes on to state that the Army must embrace a more diverse U.S. population in the future. 
um, not just for recruiting and in the ranks, but at the highest le levels of leadership. Um, it also says that equally important, leaders don't just have to execute these programs, but they've got to understand why diversity, equity, and inclusion is a strength and why it's important. My question to you, Ms. Baker, as a senior leader who has served the Army for almost 25 years, um, how would you say we've improved over time and what is your outlook for the future? Are, are we on the right track? Um, where are we headed from here? Well, I think in order to answer that, I've got to talk a little bit about my history as well. So in addition to serving the Army for the past 25 years, I grew up in the Army. I was an Army brat. Uh, I, I am the daughter of two Army veterans, actually. Uh, my mother and father were both, uh, both served in Vietnam, um, met there, married, and then my father be uh, retained, he became a career Army officer uh, and, and served for 30 years. And so I grew up in an integrated army and, and and the army was one of the first to integrate and very proud of that and i was taught that at an early early age that uh, diversity was a strength that that was part of what we should celebrate that, that i would i was fortunate to be yeah, among you know and, and and part of this large organization and part of this nation that uh was uh that really uh embraced people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, nationalities, colors, religion, and, and gender, and that that was the great thing that made the Army strong, and it was one of the wonderful things to embrace in, in terms of just having you know, a, a full life and, and, and being able to engage with people all, uh, from everywhere. And so, but I, but I saw things, you know, of course, and, and uh, you know, of course, it wasn't something that, it, it wasn't an option to my mom to stay in, um, and she had to take a different career path after uh, after she uh, married my dad and then was and then had me uh, and and so and but I also got to uh, be exposed to a lot of great women who served with him who were also raising families and so I got to see a lot of this firsthand and uh, I think that um, we have is an army probably done done gr well um, for women as well as uh, again for for uh, diversity overall throughout time, I think that those credences have been there, those values that we talk about have always been there. But I do believe that as we have progressed um, through the years, and especially right now, uh, we have, we're um, even stronger. So we have a new Secretary of the Army, the first female Secretary of the Army ever. Uh, within the Corps of Engineers, I was just taking a, uh, uh, a little uh, informal survey. I think we have four of the f the nine division commanders are are female now, um, and and we're even stronger within the SES cadre. Uh, when I first started uh, in S as the SES just a few years ago, you know, 2016, um, the joke used to be, "Hey, how many uh, uh, of the women uh, SESs of the Corps can you fit in a Prius?" Uh, because I drove a Prius, and uh, and and we say almost all of them because. Whenever we got together, we could almost all go get in my car and, and go somewhere. <laughs> and, and that has changed even in the last several years. And the great thing is, is that we all get together. And I don't know if everybody always knows that, but the, the general officers and the SES females always, we get together and talk about how can we um, promote diversity, promote this dialogue, and uh, about how we are being more inclusive, how we are removing barriers, and not just for women, but for everybody. Uh, so that we can get the best of the best within the Corps of Engineers. And so I think we are on the right track. I will never rest on our laurels and say we're done. I, I don't believe it's mission complete. I believe it's a continuous dialogue. And I, I think that one of the things that we've been very pleased to learn as we continue to uh, talk and, and start this conversation is that we've, we've got uh, uh, people who have a lot to say and are talking about where there are challenges, where they may have been exposed to um, maybe not outright bias, but unintentional or, or even un what we call unconscious bias. Uh, and and there, there have been barriers to advancement in that way. One of the things that I look at very closely is not just how are we bringing people in in the pipeline, but then what are we doing in terms of retaining and promoting? And our numbers still need to to uh, increase in that re regard in terms of uh, females 
but also people of color. And I think that that's something that we're going to continue to work on. But I think we're on the right track. And the reason we're on the right track is because of conversations we're having here today and conversations that I think are happening across the Army where people are comfortable and we're trying to sit, put together safe spaces so they can speak up. I didn't. What I can say that's most noticeable to me um, in the 25 years uh, is that people are more comfortable and open about calling it out when they see direct discrimination, but even more so, even just talking about areas where we need to change, where maybe it isn't so direct or overt, but but barriers that we may have put in place for women or people of color or, or any other uh, minorities to advance. And I think that that's very, very important that we're having that conversation. And, and I think as long as we continue to have that conversation, we're going to stay on the right track. You, you make a great point about um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment that, you know, and I don't think people necessarily realize that. So, you know, we have Women's Equality Day established in 1971. And then um, the last state to actually ratify the 19th Amendment did, did it in 1984. Um, and that's, that's pretty amazing. I was, I was blown away by that. Um, and, but you talk about being in a good place um, in the army that and 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 as a nation, at least moving forward and still making progress. And and it sounds like the army is definitely headed in the right direction. And as we get ready to observe the 50th anniversary of uh, the establishment of Women's Equality Day, um, we've experienced things like the Me Too movement, um, social unrest, political unrest, and you mentioned the effects of the global pandemic. And in many ways, 2021 doesn't seem that far removed from the challenges of the past. Um, what is your message for young women and young men and our collective future as we move forward? Well, my primary message is that we need you. We need your voice. And we're gonna do what we can to ensure that your voice is heard. Uh, we, we definitely need um, those leaders of the future, uh, in, and especially for the Army Corps of Engineers in areas of STEM, uh, we need we need a lot of of, of talent, uh, and we can't afford to disqualify or discriminate or put any barriers up to making sure we get the brightest and the best, so that we can solve the nation's toughest challenges. And so, I would say the future is bright. But we recognize that we've got a long way to go still. Keep speaking up. We're going to try to give you forums in order to do that. And uh, we're, hope we're listening and hopefully we're learning because I think that we've got a lot to learn from this next generation that's, that's coming up behind us. You make, a, you make a great point about the conversations. It's, it's easier to talk about these things uh, now than it was in 1997 or, you know, um, I'd say even even five years ago, it's easier to talk about these things. I think they're at the forefront of of society. Um, Miss Baker, so we've got um, an, another survey coming up. the The Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey is coming up. Um, do you, as a senior leader, do you look at tools like that for the feedback that you're getting um, to kind of shape the dialogues that you're having at at your level? I absolutely review the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey and look at it in extensive detail. And I leverage it to build our action plans here within NAD on what we need to be doing to improve things for the workforce. We uh, are very fortunate in that we've had a significant number of our districts uh, come up on the best place to work and, and hit, and hit the, the numbers all the time. But I'm never really comfortable sitting on our laurels. I've got to look into and dig into it. And I will tell you that uh, uh, I look at this and Mr. Koenig, my counterpart, the regional business director, uh, we take it very seriously. We hold focus sessions here within the, the NAD division workforce where we sit down and really dive into this. Well, what do you think this means? What? Why do you think we receive this score? And that is something we talk to both our supervisors as well as non-supervisors uh, and, and, and try to get feedback on what we can continue to do to improve things for the workforce. 
And uh, we've learned a lot from that. And sometimes we learn things that are hard to hear, but that's okay. That's what we're that's what we're here for. And uh, a lot of times we get very good constructive feedback that we do put into place. We have uh, through the regional management board put in place some things in terms of guidance for uh, supervisors on how to have those important performance discussions under DPMAP, and that's a definitely a direct initiative. Um, there are certain training courses that we've put in place uh, that were directly result resulted from asks that we found through the, the the FEV survey. A lot of it you can't find from just looking at that score. Although I'm a I'm really a, a I love statistics and I love to kind of dig into the 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 the, the, the ins and outs and process of the survey. But it, it comes from saying, OK, now that we've got your results, can you help us understand what it means and then help us come together and put together action plans? And so we definitely use that. And I'm not going to be satisfied until we're, we're green in every single aspect of that. And then that really is something that we have to keep then then work really hard to sustain. So it sounds like the challenge of uh, maintaining diversity, equity, and equality, or sorry, maintaining, <laughs> it sounds like the challenge of ma maintaining diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workforce is um, is not something that we ever reach an end state. It's it's something we're never mission complete on. Like you said, we we just continue to, to push forward and, and have these dialogues. If there's anything that we have learned in the last year or two uh, and especially when we have seen some of the, the 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 social unrest that we have seen in this this country this past summer and and, and earlier is that we can't ever f take it for granted that that these rights are being distributed that that everybody has everything that they need that we have to I, i've learned a lot in the last year uh, or more, uh, uh, really taking account of my own biases and saying, where, where am I? Where have I taken for granted that we're being, we're, we're being fair across the board? And how do we um, continue to listen? If we don't, if if we stop listening, I think we're gonna we're gonna find that that erosion of rights. And and I think what we're hearing um, as a nation is that there are there are very much underserved populations that still don't feel that they've realize that American dream and how do we reach out to them how do we bring them into that dialogue and then how do we act on what we hear from them is going to be very very important and I don't think that's a job that's ever finished so one other thing that we have learned this year that I think is important is that this is not just a dialogue among women we need men to join in and join in the conversation. We've had our talks with the about the McKinsey report and many of our other um, NAD forums. Uh, it's been just a, a rich conversation and I think uh, a learning experience for all that we've had both men and women join us in that. And so it's it's not a women's issue. It's a it's a it's a, as you've brought up many times today, it's an inclusion issue and we gotta continue to have that conversation together. That's excellent. Yes, ma'am. So it's a it's an ongoing Seneca Falls. We just need more men to join the dialogue. I hadn't thought about it that way. That's great. You know, here in New York, you know, being here in New York, uh, we hear a lot about that. Uh, especially we had our Fort Hamilton Women's History Month. Uh, they're very proud of the fact that that it all started here in New York, and so we we hear a lot about that uh, that that great meeting here as so, we we talk about our history here. One of the interesting things that I learned. Um, and I don't know, so I'm I'm a history nerd. My degree is in history. Um, Martha Adams wrote to John and said, "Remember the women, right?" When he when when they were working on um, the Declaration, and um, so an interesting fact under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson in 18, 1807, um, during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, the one of the last state, New Jersey, adopted its um, its state constitution, which denied women the right to vote. So women had had the right to vote in the colony of New Jersey up till 1807. They had had the right to vote in Massachusetts and other colonies, mostly in the, in the Northeast, um, especially if they owned property. But by 1807, 
all of those colonies have become states, adopted constitutions that denied women the right to vote. And I thought, I thought, man, that when when you spoke about how the dialogues that are going on today, the the social unrest that we have, some of the political maneuvering that we have, that's not new. Like that's that's in our history. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, since you're a history buff, I'm reading right now a um, it's a historical fiction. I I love historical fiction because I. Uh, I love the story, but then it always makes me go back and I, I learn some things about, you know, that I didn't know. And and some, a lot of times I'll go back and then, you know, research what, you know, the, you know, hey, was this true or wasn't true? Um, but it's a it's a wonderful um, story about Eliza Hamilton, you know, the wife of Alexander Hamilton. And it's a great great because especially, you know, everybody's all crazy about the musical right now. And it's really her story. And there's a lot of things that it kind of myths that it kind of debunks there or, sto- or parts of the storyline that they just scrunch chronologically for the musical of course in the time they've got but there's a that's that that's all the way through there because there's this discussion of women's rights and and you know they live in new york but they keep talking about well maybe we'll just go to new jersey our cousins over there can vote you know and it's really uh you know an interesting discussion and also of course the slavery discussion you know right. even as even her family owned you know they servants. I mean, they were slaves. They were. I mean, you had to call them slaves, but they were still working on the slavery and, and, and abolitionist issues even way back then. You know, in the early part of the colonial, you know, starting the country, it was it was such a discussion even then. But yeah, it was it was interesting because you said that because there was they were all like, well, New Jersey's had the right to vote for a long time, and that was a lot of the discussion is, well, are you gonna, you know, in this declaration, is it gonna include everybody and you know, and, and even there was some discussion because they, you know, they all knew each other. You know, well, make sure you're telling Mr. Jefferson that he needs to, you know, give us the right to vote. So it's it's very, very interesting. You know, all those themes kind of continue. All, and I, that is what I kind of took away as I'm re- reading this um, is, is how many of the things we're wrestling with now, we were, they were wrestling with then. I don't, I just don't think we resolved them. We've got to just continue to refine. So. That's the end of season two, episode one, the filter episode. I'd like to thank a few people who helped make this happen. Colonel Brian Hallberg, Miss Karen Baker, Kristen Mazur, Kim Kelsch, Heather Lockwood, from Virginia Beach City Public Schools, Melissa Ingram, from the city of Virginia Beach, Samantha Davidson, Jen Gunn, and my boss, Mark Havelin. Thanks so much, and until next time, this is Core Talk.